um, I wrote when I was in, from one of my reflections classes, and I chose this prayer because I'm, we're going to go into the mystical laws and creation and the power of your words and uh, what it, and the appreciation of, uh, well, never mind. Let me imagine I am dying. Let me imagine that I am leaving this world and preparing to say farewell to this life I have been given and to everyone I have walked this life with. Let me feel the depth of that anguish in my heart and in my soul. I need to feel that. I need to feel how much I would break in sadness so that I might wake in gratitude for this life that I have. For every second, every minute, every breath of this life that I have. Let me feel the sorrow of parting with those I love so that I, may, that I might never again see them with anger but with gratitude and wonder that they are walking this life with me. Let me look at every flower in nature as a miracle of creation. Let me wake up each morning knowing that every day could be my last and I must be fully present in each day of my life, not in yesterday and not worried about tomorrow. I must give each day the best of all that I am. So let me visit my end so that I might start yet again with the fullness of my life. I want my soul to be in charge of my life choices now. I do not want to waste my life dwelling in pettiness or anger, pride or disappointment. Keep me from creating my own suffering and harming others in the process. Hover over me, Lord, with grace and guidance. Okay. I want to, I actually, one of my dear friends, Jean Hausman, is in the audience. I don't know where she is. Jean? There's Jean and her daughter. And Jean and I go back a long, long way. And several of you have come up and said how much you love this place and being here. And you've had a, a chance to be here for a little bit. And Sedona has a reputation for being a uh, you know, one of those power centers and a place between worlds, so to speak. Um, and this time in history, this time we're living, it's a privilege to be alive now. And when we talk about being between worlds or this shift that we're living and we are living it, it's a challenge to capture that to actually produce evidence of it, to actually say it's, it, it's happening. It's, 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 a, it's a frustrating challenge sometimes. But I'm gonna take advantage of Jean being here. And I'm gonna share a story, because Jean was part of it, that happened in a place that is the sim that's similar to Sedona, and has that similar feel that I could feel because it is, um, it, it is something that happened to me and, and Jean, actually Jean was a part of this, that it woke me up to what's happening in our world now in a way that made it visceral, real, and part, all the more part of what I am teaching. And it, and if someone had just lectured to me about it, it would have remained in the lecture thing, category. And this made it in my blood and bones. I used to do these kinds of workshops at a wonderful place called Miraville, which is in Arizona. Yeah, Tucson. So it's in Arizona too. It's a wonderful place. And it started out as a uh, center for alcohol rehab, and then it eventually became um, a lovely center, just like this. It's a health spa. And I did, I, I was in room six, 606. And Miraville has rooms that are just like this. They have these little room things, they have these pods. And my pod area was not part of these 
you know, the standard ones, but rather it was the, these newer ones that were built down there. So you had to take this path and you had to go down there. And they were, they are in the, I'm having technical problems. Okay. They are in the Zen style, which means they're very sleek and they have like concrete walls and those sliding glass doors with the, did I lose something? Keep going, keep going. Right. Burning all your sweaters. Oh, you're not okay. So, and it has sleek furniture inside. And my point in describing all of this is this is the kind of stuff that doesn't make noise. You know, concrete walls don't make noise. It's not like my house, which is old and wooden and talks to you all the time. So just like this in the workshop, on, um, when I arrive on Thursday, I go to my room at 3.30, 3 in the afternoon, I throw my stuff down, and, and, and the room is quiet as, as, as a convent. And I like that because I have to you know, take my notes and kind of get, get myself centered and steady and get myself into this and I like quiet I like quiet I don't like noise and I don't like sound and I don't like TV and I don't like that I'm, I'm I've gotten that way so the room is silent there's nothing that can make noise nothing concrete does not make noise so that night I go to bed and I hear this banging on the ceiling like banging on the roof, not the ceiling, the roof. This pounding like <laughs> And I'm thinking, what a loud room. What a loud room. But I have a loud house. I have one of those old houses that go rickety rack, and when you turn on the heat, it goes boom, boom, boom. So noise does not, I'm so used to it, right? And so I just turn around and go to sleep. Now it's Friday. I go back to my room in the afternoon and I, I have to collapse after I teach. I'm tired. You talk for five hours. You are tired. You're burned. You just have to turn it off. And I feel like this after I, I so I go back to my room at 3.30 in the afternoon. It's quiet. It's totally quiet. Now I come back after dinner, I'm going to bed and the pounding starts. This pounding starts. And it starts and it's in the air duct. It's actually in the air duct. And I'm thinking, what the heck? What is this, right? And then it's not just in the air duct. The next thing you know, it's like in front of me. Here. Right, it's right in front of me. This is, you know, and I'm thinking, what the heck is going on? So this is, this is, wait, wait this was Thursday night, because it happened three nights before we did the ceremony. I still don't, I still don't think anything. I'm thinking, this was the, the second night was the air duck, okay. And I'm thinking, this is a weird ass room. So then I go, wait. so then the third night, the third night, now the noise is in front of me and I'm in bed and I hear the sound of some, like someone taking their shoe and going under, a cur going under one of those heavy blinds that they use to block the sun out. And I shoot up and I turn the light on and I think something's in this room. Something is in this room. And I thought, is there an animal in this room? And I look around and I think, it's impossible for an animal to get in this room sealed, you know? And I, and I, I look around and I thought, and, I, and I'm real still, because I know what evil feels like. I know what evil feels like. Um, and I thought, I'm not, hmm. And I turn it off, turn the light off, and I go, I go down like this. And all of a sudden, I feel a, a spirit looking over me this close in bed. And I don't know if you have ever been so frightened that you hear your ears 
your heart in your ear. I, I'm not kidding you. I am laying in bed and I hear boom, 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 boom in my ear. And something was here and I, I said this prayer. I said, God, send me a legion of angels. I'm going to turn on the light and I don't know what I'm going to see. And I lean over for the light and I, and I turn it on and I open my eyes and there was nothing there, but there was something there. And now, and now here comes the other side of me. Now I'm angry. <laughs> now I'm feeling I have to teach in the morning and you're messing with me. And that's not the word I'm using. <laughs> and I said, so I sit on my bed and I said, show yourself. I'm demanding, show yourself. You got my attention, show yourself. And I said, you coward, get out of here. But and the, 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 let me back up. When I turned on the light and I, and I held still, the cabinet door opened this way and then shut by half an inch. And that's when I said, okay, I know you're here. I know you're here. I said, show yourself. You have my attention, what do you want? Now Miraville is known to have a Native American that wanders the land there. And they have actually caught glimpses on a camera, on the security camera. But I didn't know that. The kind of thing I don't think they tell to me. Anyway, <laughs> I did, so, the next morning, now it's, it's, now it's Saturday morning, and I'd been up screaming at a spirit, but I don't, you know, and I was so infuriated that I was disturbed because of teaching. And, and I, when someone disturbs me when I teach, I cannot tell you how crazy I can. So then the room got quiet, and I knew whatever it was had left. So I go back to bed. And I'm thinking, what? Now I get up Saturday morning, and my good friend Peter Shaw, who is kind of an organic shaman of sorts, he's been to shamanic workshops, he's, he is a natural pirate, he spends four months a year in India with his, uh, at his sacred place. He's someone of the earth and, and deeply organically spiritual. That's what I would say. Just deep. So I walk out and he looks at me and he says, there's a, there's a native, he's got a cigarette in his mouth. He goes, there's a Native American behind you. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect, right? It's perfect. And I said, now we're, we, we don't know what to do. That night, Jean and Peter and I do a ceremony in the room. I always have holy water on me and a rosary, as I do right now, right now. Um, Jean had sage for some reason. Peter had tobacco. <laughs> And I'm thinking this spirit was passing through, maybe caught, liked my room, I don't know. But we do a prayer ceremony. We say the Hail Mary, we say the Our Father, we do a, a release, we acknowledge that maybe it's caught between worlds. And we do this prayer. And we sprinkle tobacco and we sprinkle holy water. We use the elements of the earth, we light candle. And we acknowledge you could be between worlds. You need, you need prayers. You need prayers to move on. That night, I'm not bothered. No visit, nothing. The next morning, Jean and I are having breakfast and Peter, and we're talking about that, that it was a quiet night. And what happens is another woman in my workshop, whose name is Mercedes, and she's from Puerto Rico, and she, doesn't know anything about this. Nothing, zero, nothing. And she comes up, she looks like she'd been up all day. She had gotten a letter, she had gotten a call from a woman who lives in Puerto Rico. Now Mercedes has a place in Florida and Texas. This woman is one of those old shamanic channel crone kind of people. 
She doesn't speak any English. And Mercedes says, um, I got this phone call. Now, now Miraval, if some of you have been there with me, know, you know they don't want your phone on, and there aren't very, very many places like this where you get phone service. So the fact that this woman could get through to Mercedes is interesting in the first place. She reaches her. She has no idea where Mercedes is, much less who she knows, much less anything. This is an old woman who is in touch with the other side. And she says, there is a spirit who won't leave me alone. And, and he's got a message. And it's for a woman named Carolyn. Do you know a Carolyn? <laughs> when, so Mercedes says, look, I translated this as best as I can in here. I have this letter on my altar. I have it on my altar. And this letter said, do you remember this letter, Jean? This spirit said, I am the gatekeeper of the land you're on. I am the gatekeeper. And you came on this land without the ceremony. I saw you. He said, you have, you have a big light. But you did not do ceremony. You did not recognize the sacredness of this land. And then he said, and I know you're coming back. And it was true. He said, I know you're coming back. He said, you have to do ceremony on this holy land. And if you, didn't think, if you don't think that I, from that time on, honor these lands. The letter went on to say, you know, you have to respect these holy places. I was so stunned by this. That, that night, that, that my last night there, quiet as a church mouse. But I went out and I said, I, you know, I, I mean, that's, this was Sunday morning, so there was not another night there. But when I went back to my room to collect my bags, I, I went on the little porch that they have and I looked out. Okay, so the next time I went to Miraville and I said to David, I must have this room. I must, I must, I must. And I had that room the next several times we went to Miraville. I will always have that room. And I go there. The first thing I do, first thing, I, I have tobacco. I have my holy water. I have this. I said, I am here. And I, do, I honor this land. I acknowledge you. But let me tell you something. After that, and understanding gate, the gatekeeper, and that there are gatekeepers, Shortly after that, I had this dream. I'm in my shower at home, and I have this dream. And I see the earth, the earth, and the latitude and longitude. And it was sparkling. It was just sparkling. And then it changed to the shape of an apple, like Newton's apple that hit him when he, when he um, was sitting under a tree and said, hmm, gravity. But then the apple split in two. And it started to quake. And I saw the, 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 the lines inside the, the apple start changed to the uh, veins of the interior of the earth, the veins of lead, the veins of gold, the veins. And it looked like this. And then I saw the earthquakes. And then I saw what would be what eventually what was in fact the major earthquake that hit and became um, the tsunami of Fukushima and then I realized gatekeepers were everywhere and that in fact they were organizing these events and they were organizing them to return nature to balance it was all about balance, that's all. It was all about the return to balance. And that, that this is all about just it, we have to return to balance. And that it is a coordination of balance. That's all it is. And you have to understand it impersonally, including, including 
the return of balance of the human species. It is all about returning to balance, that's all. And, the, and truly, as I now introduce the mystical laws, and anything else I teach, one of the, the, to me, the greatest handicap you can have in learning anything cosmic, in learning any truth, is to position yourself in, the per, in, in, in a personal position versus impersonal. Everything about knowledge is impersonal. And if you study it from the position of, I don't want this to be so, you're going to lose your footing. So let me say this differently. You, when you learn, for example, the first law, which is the law of gravitas, the law of gravity, the law of to, to, and the power of your word, that it's up to you to decide what you're going to give gravity to in your life. It's up to you to give to, to do in Buddha in Buddhism what they call attached to a spectacle. It's up to you to decide what's a, what's worthy of. I think I'm going to make a big deal out of this and not that. That's up to you. It's up to you. It this. It, um, you may say, no, 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 it's not up to me. Yes, it is up to you. It's totally up to you what you decide is a big deal to give gravity to. And the consequences of what happens, it's not personal. It's the nature of the law. It's true for anybody. Anybody who drinks arsenic is going to die. It is not personal. So when you learn that cause and effect is the nature of the law, this is when you, you have to begin to examine, do I really want to make this choice? Do I really want to act in this way? This is the power of light and darkness. This is when you say, I really have to begin to examine the choices that I make and the manner in which I rationalize the choices I make. You can still hold your childhood accountable, but it doesn't change the consequences that the bill that you're paying. You may say, well, I am a gambling addict. That may be fine. And you may say, it's because of my childhood. That's true, too. But here's your bill. You still owe a million dollars. I don't care about your childhood. Here's your bill. This is the way cause and effect works. It doesn't care about your childhood. It doesn't care anything about this. And neither does your health. What you have to understand is health operates with a sharp knife. It operates according to the laws, not your emotions. Not your, it is not sentimental. It is not sentimental. You gotta get very, you gotta have a machete about yourself. Do, do, are, you, are you gonna be with me here? You have to have a machete. Healing is a machete. It's not sentimental. Just like being a clear intuitive. Sentiment is destructive, sentimental. It's destructive. You get sentimental about a lamb in a, in a, at, a, at lamb's farm. But you must have a machete when it comes to your healing. If you're serious about getting out of hell, you need a machete. And that's just the way it is. Sentiment is not your friend. And, I, and, and let me just shift gears and come back to this in a minute. I was talking yesterday about miracles. 
and about the phenomenon of the speed at which we heal. And I want to draw this. It's, a, it's all of you know this because you've been with me before, but it, it's a t I just need to tell, put this in your head because it is just so valuable. Maybe I'll draw it bigger. These are, just, these are the only drawings I have, so be kind. <laughs> but it's true. And, if, and the simple is better. You think of yourself like this. When you make choices, and the first law, the first law, and you're here in your first chakra, really, is the law of gravity, gravitas, to make something grave. To decide, this is serious enough for me to take my life force and uh, plug into it. Plug into it. So, you know, I use the example because it's really true. We are so petty sometimes. We are so petty. I didn't get enough attention or, or did you hear what that person said to me? And I want you to think about this. You st you, you, uh, I remember this story, this chapter in my, I, I was walking off a stage one time after a lecture and I, I had to get to the ladies room. There was not an, I, it had to. This is not on tape. I was having a menstrual accident. Okay, now I'm back on tape. <laughs> I had to get to the ladies room. Ladies, right? Yeah. This is like, get out of my way. And this woman stops me and she says, can I talk to you? And I said, no. And I just kept going. <laughs> no. And it's that sort of self-entitlement. I'm entitled. I paid for a ticket. I have to talk to you now. I bought your time. <laughs> right? Get out of my way. Boom. Well, I got an eight-page letter from her. Not one, eight. Telling me off. Telling me off about how she was entitled to, to have that time with me because she traveled all that way and yada, 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 yada. Just, woof. Right. So I read the first page and threw it out. I'm not going to listen to that because there was just no sense of maybe something was going on with me. Zero. It was all about her. I'm not going to, I threw it out. Well, she was waiting for an answer. And I know this now because we've been friends for 25 years. <laughs> okay, so she was waiting for this, and she knows I tell this story too. And, and, and I don't exaggerate it because she knows, and I know. So she was seething that I did not answer this letter, but I don't know that, right? So much so that she shows up in another one. <laughs> About a year later, she shows up at another one, right? And she comes up to me and she says, I'm the one who wrote you that letter. <laughs> and honest to God, I have a bad memory. I really do. And, and, she's, and I said, what letter? <laughs> I could not have said a worse thing. <laughs> and she said, or, or as it turns out, a better thing. Because I, I had no attachment, you understand? I, I didn't read it, I didn't, and it didn't matter to me. It was, it was, I, now, I have no strings attached here. Now this is important. Where she had turned this, this was an anchor now that was growing into a, a narrative in her head, that was growing into an issue, that was growing into, who knows? And as it turned out, a bigger deal because she was um, thinking of a career in an intuitive stuff and bah, 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 bah. And so now I was the reason she would never be successful. <laughs> now I, oh Christ. So she built this whole big thing. <laughs> Bless you, Anna. So, and I agree. So she said, well, I wrote you this eight-page letter. And now I looked at her and I said, and now her, her anger was striking me as humorous, right? which is not the thing to do. So I was like, you? All that? She said, did you read my I said, no. No, I threw it out. <laughs> and I, well, I did. So I said, why don't you sit down and tell me about your letter? 
You're obviously absolutely enraged. What did I do that did this to you? Well, you didn't talk to me. And so then I told her why. I, she, you could have written me. I said, no. I don't deserve to be spoken to like that, really. I said, why? I said, how is it that you come to something and you get this mindset that my actions are all about you? Are all about you. And you make up this story in your head and then you decide that unless you talk to me, this whole thing in your life won't happen. And you make up this whole drama, and then you project failure onto me. And this is what we do. Here, this is this. These are self-made dramas. This is how we suffer. This is self-imposed suffering. Optional suffering, but this is what we do. If only that person had done, if only I had spoken to this person, if only, if only, this is the only, if only, and this is gravity. We give gravity, gravitas. If only they had said this, if only this, if only had gone to college, if only, the if onlys, the this, the that. This is this. These are anchors. These are big deals, and this is how we impose suffering on ourselves. Suffering that's optional. Optional suffering, people. In your mind, the made up if onlys. So, do I have any hands here for optional anchors? The if onlys? The things you tell yourself could have been, would have been, should have been? How, how many do we have? Oh, looky. Okay, we have. All right, I want you to take a moment here, just write down four. Could have been, should have been, would have been anchors that you actually have, that you tell yourself, my life would have been. Do you know what? I have a neighbor. This is the biggest one of all. I, I dare you to outdo this one. <laughs> I'm going to give you a dare. I'm going to give you a dare. None of you can outdo this one. I moved into my house in, in um, 11 years ago, and there's a neighbor. I won't mention her name, but I sure would like to. <laughs> and she obviously had a fantasy that she was meant to be a great writer, and it is unfulfilled. So one of the gravitas major league things that you might have tucked away in your backpack that is a cause of great suffering, and here's the operative word, throws you off balance. Balance, balance is your balance, that throws you, that directs you this way, that makes you see your life as a dysfunctional thing, as if it's been off course all along, as if it should have been going this way, but it's going that way, is, is, that you are an unfulfilled something or other. So she, what she does is instead of obviously being the great Pulitzer writer she should have been or whatever, my neighborhood has a, is very friendly and intimate and the neighbors love each other and, and it's nice. It's very, very nice. And we have a nice like um, chat and if anyone needs anything the internet goes out and if like if you're away from home someone will say well I'm, I'm gone for like I said uh, hi everybody I'm gone for the weekend so they'll they'll get my mail they'll check they just it's it's sweet it's it's really nice this one if there's ever an issue that's going up or whatever instead of just saying like um, uh, someone's car was you know got st st uh, slashed a wheel got slashed or whatever I'm making but instead of saying okay well t we'll look alive the kids are out for the summer you know they're up to pranks or something she will write three pages of well I remember when my family moved to Oak Park 
40 years ago, and it wasn't like this, but in those days, we had, and she'll, she'll take the opportunity to, to carry on because she never really became a writer. So, blah, 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 blah. When I first moved there 10 years ago, and I experienced the first of her diatribes, I made the mistake, well, I wrote back and I said, well, that was really interesting. I moved here, I'm at 305 Forest. She fires back. Oh, I know who you are. <laughs> and she said, um, I worked with you, and then she names the newspaper, and where I worked for four weeks when I was 22 years old. And she said, and you stole an article I was writing. <laughs> and she said, you put my name on it. And I spoke to this editor, and he didn't do anything about it. And I went, she said, and I have the article in my basement. <laughs> I, 22 years old, I was right out of college. I was, do you understand? I, had no, I hadn't written anything. I was not, she saved. I, this is like saving a college paper article. I'm looking at this, and she said, I wouldn't be surprised if you have, how did she put it, plagiarized everything you've ever written. Now that, <laughs> them's fighting words. <laughs> I sat at my desk. Do you, that took my breath away. I mean, I had just moved into this neighborhood. I had just renovated a house. I looked, and here was a neighbor accusing me of the ultimate crime for a writer. I mean, this is as bad as, this is our version of pedophilia. I, I, I'm telling you, I was breathless for days. For days, I didn't even want to walk out of my house. I did not know how to handle this. I'd never in my professional life been accused of plagiarism. I, I mean, I, I really so honor my integrity. Well, now, then I went from shock to <laughs> And I thought, okay, I can't, do I pull out the medium gun, <laughs> the big gun? But I, but I don't want to create disharmony. I've just moved here. I don't want to be ostracized. It's difficult enough being a, um, a lone wolf in a neighborhood full of couples. They're already suspect. She's straight, what is she? You know, this kind of thing. <laughs> and um, you know, you kind of have to establish that so they don't think you're too, you know. And, because um, it's really obvious, oh my God, she wants to be single? What kind of freak is she, you know? So I finally wrote her, and I said, well, well, well. <laughs> and I said, so I'll tell you what. I said, I guess I'm the reason you, I said, I can't, I, I said I'm so shocked I can't see straight. I said, I, I'm going to give you some options here. I said, I am glad, I would be delighted to introduce you to an agent. I would be delighted to introduce you to an editor. I said, what can I do to make up for your floundering career? <laughs> what can I do? I said, and in fact, I said, I will let you tell them that I'm the reason you have no career. I said, what would you like to do? I said, bring that little article and say, she's the reason. Tell them you think I'm a plagiarist and watch what happens. I said, go right ahead, plead your case. I said, I'm willing to sit there and listen and have my colleagues listen to it. I said, I'm not gonna, I said, I'm not going to. I said, what can I do to help you get out of this? And I said, otherwise, what can we do to bridge this? And she said, nothing. And I've never seen her since. I've never seen her since, ever, nothing, zero. But all these years, she's held on to this 
convinced that, I, convinced, do you understand that I was just a college one year out, uh, that I was, that nothing, do you get, do you get, I hadn't even gone to graduate school, much less become a medical intuitive, nothing. The size of that anchor, now this is major league, go beat me. <laughs> One up me. That is major league. That's major league. And here's what is so intriguing. The gods arranged for us to meet again. How about that? The gods arranged for us to meet again. I think that is magnificent. There I am, right on the road again. The opportunity to heal was right there. Right there to unplug this anchor. And her rage and pride was so big, so big, so furious, that, that she absolutely could not do it. It was, even, it was even worse. Now this, when we talk about why people don't heal, and self-imposed suffering is we get into the gravitas of our stories. And the stories become so significant to our identity that we will not let them go. We simply won't let them go. Even when someone comes up and says, look, I'm, will, I'm the other participant in the story, I'm the other character, you're Hansel, I'm Gretel. Let's have a different ending and get out of this forest. We gotta get out of this forest. We've been in here for centuries. Let's see if we can rewrite it. No. I want to end up in a boiling pot with a witch. I mean, we've got to, you know, <laughs> there, there comes a time when you've got to be able to pull the plug and rewrite your stories. So, you know, settle in here and say, what do you give gravity to? that is just a self-imposed suffering here that throws you off balance, a way that you think, a way that you tell yourself something that's simply not true. There's no, but you give weight to it. It could be any, it, it, and, and uh, um, be imaginative, be imaginative. One of the ways you impose suffering is you lie to yourself in this way. Here's one, I'll start tomorrow. You postpone your life. You postpone changes. That is a huge anchor, I'll start tomorrow. Or I don't need to do this, it's not important for me. This doesn't apply to me. That's another serious anchor. This doesn't apply to me. Everything applies to us in some way. I still can't get over that woman. Um, it took 40 years. I know. It's ridiculous that it doesn't change anything else you've said, but she eats a lot. No, 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 honey, no. Because she got my goat for two days, for, and it cost her 40 years now. What kind of investment is that? And it really, and it cost her, in her mind, she didn't have a career for a life. No, it wasn't worth it. <coughs> no, not at all. Not at all. It, it, what I get is, it tr truly, it is so shocking to me that somebody would, would you make an investment where you put 40 years worth of your energy into something for a two-day payback? It is so... But what I can't get over is that human beings do this. Is that we do this. 
I, I say as if I'm not participant, is that we do things like this. Is that we, and this is the great teaching of Buddha, and Jesus, is that spot your illusions because they will cost you everything. These are spectacles. You know, if I, I, and I've said to people, bring me this thing you're so angry at. What'd you get so angry at? Well, did you hear what that woman said to me? Did you hear that? No, but bring it to me. Bring me in a box what she said to you. Does it fit in a box? Well, no, because they were words. Well, bring me what you heard in a box. Bring the sound in a box. Bring the words in a box. Because it was an illusion. But you attach to something, and it will cost you your life. Because you give gravity, you turn it into an anchor, and it's self-imposed. It's totally self-imposed. Totally. What made you write back to her, as opposed to letting that uh, go? What, what made you write? What made me write back to her? One, I, it was, uh, uh, I think, a, a couple of things. One is uh, um, the shock of being accused of plagiarism. So there was a sense of, um, I needed to speak up about that. You know, um, there was a sense of injustice here that was so preposterous. And I wanted to, to write that, like, are you kidding me? You think my entire career, oh, she accused me that she said that I probably stole my house through plagiarism. That's a pretty big thing. And I felt like, well, I can't let you, I had to do something rather than let you start poisoning my life with my neighbors. I couldn't ignore that. I couldn't. And I don't think anybody should. That was, I needed to nip that in the bud. I just say, wait a minute here. This is a violation of integrity that is so bad and so deep and so absurd. I was not even an anybody, and this is an article, and, you're and if I thought somebody was plagiarizing someone, I would have grabbed them by the earlobe and tossed them on the ground. So, and that you would keep this 40 years and put it in a, a little brown column, now it's this big, and you think that this, the absurdity of this is so off the charts for me. It's like being arrested now at my age, having paid all my taxes, living, not, never even consciously taking a nickel from someone, and suddenly being arrested because in 1960, in 1970, they found out I didn't pay two cents on taxes. It's that absurd to me that I was two cents shy on a 1970s income tax. It's that absurd to me. Yeah. What would you do if you were ever plagiarized? What would I do if I was plagiarized? If someone took my work, and they have. They have, just like they take my idea. You know, there are people in the world that do original thought, and then there are people whose task it is to synthesize. And then there are people who just copy because they, they're not able to do original thought. They just don't do original thought. And they're not capable of it. And um, And when they credit you, that's fine, but when they don't, like I can't tell you how many people teach sacred contracts. What are you gonna do? But it's so associated with me. You know, but it, people are what they are. They, they, they you, you know, the, the longing for that realm of original thought, but, but it is what it is. You can't chase every tale, right? You can't do that. You can't chase everyone that's, you can't. You just have to, you know. Wait a minute, you're supposed to be doing things here. Why? Me? Yeah. I don't think that that situation was necessarily about resolution or even revenge. I really 
feel like she had created her own world that she was living in, and for you to come in and offer any type of resolution or solutions to that would dismantle all the systems that she had spent 40 years constructing. I think you're right. She would not, for any case, in any realm, ever, ever, ever let you resolve or do anything. You being a, a more eloquent person would see this as, a, as an opportunity to resolve, but she was not going to have any of that. It would have dismantled her whole system and kind of belief system. But that's what we all have to look at here. That's exactly where, you know, she is the absolute apex of this example of, of the narratives we tell us that we give gravity. And this is the law of gravity. We have to be careful. And let me just add simultaneously the lecture, to introduce the lecture of the power of our words. Truly, every word is a universe in itself. Every word is a universe. I mean, if I... We don't realize how powerful our words are until you pause and think, do I want to say yes here or no? Hurry up, yes or no. And you realize, I am going to direct my life here. Will you marry me or not? Ooh. Do you love me or not? Yes or no? Your whole world spins on a yes or a no. These the words we use are so huge. Am I going to get angry now? Yes or no? Should I get angry about this or should I laugh about it? Do I want the word laugh or anger here? Which one should I use? Because in this situation, I can put laugh or I can put anger. Now, which one do I want? Do I want to take this seriously or do I want to take it humorously? Which word do I want? Because how would that make it look? Now, before I respond, gravitas. Before I give gravity to this, let me, let me, see, let me choose a few options here. Should I take this seriously or should I take it humorously? And you put, you put these goggles on before you respond to the situation you're in. And if you actually could hold yourself back, this column, if you could hold, put the bit in your mouth before you respond, put the bit in your mouth before you respond to the circumstance you're in, realizing I'm in a creative vortex. Do I want to just let this go? Because in a second, I'm going to be in a totally different vortex. If I respond, I freeze it. It's like taking a snapshot and attaching myself to that snapshot and claiming that snapshot is the whole vortex. And then I have to keep telling a story about the snapshot instead of letting the vortex keep going instead of letting the story keep telling itself. If you respond and say, this is what happened, I'm telling you, this is what happened, you are taking a snapshot and claiming this is the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Instead of learning to hold yourself back, breathe deeply and say, no, hold still, otherwise you are jumping into a snapshot and you will be frozen in this and you'll freeze you'll be frozen in this and if you get frozen in a snapshot you become anchored in it and it goes into your cell tissue and it keeps playing in your cell tissue and this is called cell memory and it densifies and that's why you keep telling the story about it. Well, this cell memory, zip, this cell memory. And it becomes dense. Okay? And, and these are how we get these anchors. Okay? These are how these anchors happen. Because we keep taking snapshots.
Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, honey, you're so soft. Okay. I'm just saying, all of us look negative with our painful childhood. You know, I'm negative with negative thoughts, but like she had about you all these years. Right. But how do we you have that? negative thoughts about your childhood. Yes, I think many of us do. Also. Right. Neg and we, you, everybody has negative, right, okay, all right, okay. That's classic, like first chakra. Everybody has negative thoughts about their childhood, so you gotta go back here. The way my neighbor does about me. <laughs> does. Let's be real. Okay, let's not let her off the hook. Just because I'm a fish that's free, she's still got bad pole in the water. In the water. Um, all right, so I'm going to take you by the hand and I'm going to put you up here. Your childhood is all of our childhoods are what they are, are what they are. And one of the, what we do, what we think healing is, and this is the great illusion, is that we can go and make our childhood different. Is that we can go and talk to the people and talk to the people who wounded us and that somehow or other, all the cast of characters involved made a mistake. No, 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 we don't recognize. Your mind may recognize that, but the rest of you is not in for that. The rest of you has a different agenda. The rest of you that is not so rational wants vengeance. It wants its day in court. It wants to have a eye for an eye day at the, at the play school. Yeah, my neighbor wanted to smack her career and say, I'm those, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, she needed a target. Which is amazing, because I was nobody. She should have picked, I don't know, she should have picked John McCullough or somebody, somebody faint who was already Dickens, you know. <laughs> Go after a ghost, but um, what we want is we want comeuppance. We, that kind of holding on comes from somebody made a mistake somewhere. This wasn't supposed to be my childhood and I want an explanation for it. It's archetypal. I want to go back and have people acknowledge they blew it and it is a form of entitlement. It's a form of, some. I'm owed an explanation. This wasn't supposed to happen that way. And two, I need people to acknowledge how much they hurt me. How much damage was done, and I need them to witness this and own it. And that's what they haven't done. You didn't accept it. You've talked about it. You've talked about it and 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 talked about it with yourself. I'm sorry, that doesn't work. Talking does not heal anything. And this is something we've, we have to come to terms with. It's just talk. It's nothing but conversation. What healing, you don't, healing, healing is not about talking. That's the chatter stage. It's a stage. The next step comes when you get to the irrational. But I don't want to talk about this anymore. I want to beat the hell out of them. I want them to, first of all, feel the hurt that they did to me. And there's a part of that that's true. Now, your mind may want to say, I do, yes, you do. Cut your head off when I'm talking to you. I'm not interested in your sophisticated mind. I want to go into your gut that says, you're damn right I do. I want them to feel what I felt. Two, I want them to stand witness to all the times they don't, they, I want them to acknowledge the hurt and acknowledge the pain and acknowledge the humiliation. I want acknowledgement, the role of the witness. The role of the witness is absolutely tantamount. It must happen in the healing process. 
has to be witnessed. I, I have to be validated. I've, I have to be validated. Number three, somehow we have a model in our suffering that suffering is, needs to be balanced by something needs to be given to me that alleviates and promise, that makes my life easier in some way because of what I've gone through. And I haven't gotten that yet. That somehow I'm owed a cosmic explanation. That somehow this shouldn't have happened to me. That's, that, there is an element of that. And none of this, your mind can say you don't, but that is not true. This is not rational. It is emotional. And the way we feel is very different than the way we think. And that's why we don't get out of this, because we don't own that. We don't own it. And this is why the mind is useless in healing, because it tells us what's polite, but it doesn't tell us what's dirty. It doesn't tell us what's down, dirty, and true. It doesn't get into the darker side of the healing process. And some part of the dark side that says, I have processed this. Will you shut up about process? And get into, I really want to hurt them. I w you know what? One time I saw, I, went, I was at the first time I went ever, ever, ever to an Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. No, I'm going to say this differently. The first time I ever went to a workshop, and it was an Elizabeth Kubler-Ross workshop. And I went there as an undercover reporter to set her up. To expose her as a fraud. I know. And I came out loving her so much, and I, and I actually wrote a piece for, uh, never mind. I remember when Elizabeth was dying, she was, she'd call me up and she'd say, do a reading for me. Tell me when I'm going to die. And she'd say, these goddamn illnesses are so hurting me. And she was so funny. Anyway, I had never witnessed anything like I saw with Elizabeth in that workshop. Never, ever, never, never, never. I had no idea what I was going into. I had no idea what this death and dying stuff was. Nothing. Zero. I wanted to, she had been, at the time, she was a professor at the University of Chicago, and she was being, she had just uh, delivered her resignation, and then she took it back, but she had offered her resignation because, um, this was in the 70s, because she it was heavy into her death and dying. I was a journalist, freelancer at the time. Whoa. And um, Elizabeth, this is a very famous chapter of her life. She brought into her psychi psychiatry, psychiatric class, class on, um, one class in psychiatry, a young woman, I think she was 20 years old, she was dying of leukemia. She said to her students, ask her questions. She's in the dying stage. And it was shocking for these students. It was shocking. It just, it just blew, it was shocking. Um, anyway, it, and she was reprimanded by the administration. She had enough of them. She, she decided to resign, and then what happened was, while she was at her, this was the story, by the way, that made the front page of the Tribune, which is why I was then, uh, I got this job offer to write this story. This is the story that inspired that. Um, so while she was writing her resignation in her office, a former patient, so I'm gonna hit a pause button here, if you're in the hospice business, what does former patient mean? <laughs> the patient has passed on. A former patient comes into her office by the name of Mrs. Schwartz, comes in and says, I've been sent to tell you you're not to resign. She asks this Mrs. Schwartz, can you actually sign your name? And she did. So she had proof that she was there. Well, blah, 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 blah. And I was, you know, um, took a, co a commission to write this article that exposed her as this fraud. 
and, and the whole story of how I even got to her got to her workshop. I'd never done a workshop. I'd never, I couldn't, I didn't even know where to find her. Um, anyway, I end up in this workshop in Appleton, Wisconsin. Uh, so she had 70 people there in the, in, and she was flanked by these, this husband and wife team that were really suspect people to me. But anyway, the way that Elizabeth did this workshop is she had these people <laughs> Every single person introduced themselves, and they were all, some people were, were in the dying stages, and other people were there because they wanted to get in touch with their wounds and get them out. I never, I cannot tell you what, this was like throwing me into the deep water without an internet. A, in a, in a, what do you call this? Inner tube. <laughs> and that too. So one by one, they're talking, and I'm, I'm there, I'm there to expose her. So when it got to me, I said, I'm here. And I, I <laughs> whoa. And then I see these people and they would come up and they, she had a mattress and a rubber hose and they would start talking about their wounds. They'd start screaming. Now, I hadn't even gone to graduate school yet, much less popped open as an intuitive. And they're screaming and beating this mattress and yelling about being hurt and all of this stuff. This Okay, here's number one. This irrational behavior out of what seemingly looked like rational people sitting in a chair a moment before. Watch the meter go from, no, I'm from the north side of Chicago. One minute later, they're screaming on a mattress. And I'm, what is that? Okay, I, all right. Number two, this, this, the memories of abuse that were coming out of these people who were a moment ago people I was having lunch with, talking about ordinary jobs. What do you do? I'm a salesperson. I'll never forget this. I'm a salesperson at um, Marshall Fields, still Marshall Fields. That afternoon, on this mattress screaming about having been incested as a child again and again and seeing this um, uh, father come in at night not being able to stop him screaming wanting to scream couldn't I, I, I was I'm telling you I had just had lunch with her and now the hysterics and the 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 scream was from her ovaries which she was losing to cancer Okay, now there was this African-American woman and she gets on the mattress and, and, she, and I'm, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm beginning to shake inside because I mean, I, I gotta tell you, this was new for me, more than new. This was new and very uncomfortable, painfully uncomfortable. And this, this woman, uh, starts crying right away and then she tells says something I'd never heard in my life ever ever she says she has a little baby two years old and then she says she starts crying she says oh God have mercy on me and she said I took baby food and I put this in there and I put that in it and I shoved it in her mouth and I shoved it in her mouth and she was gagging and it didn't stop me, didn't stop me. I wanted her to gag, I wanted her to get sick. I wanted her, and I, I, I she said, I wanted her, she said, and then I, I didn't do that. And she started listing one abuse after another, after another that she did to her own child. She did, I, I'm telling you, I can still see her face, I can still see her crying, I can still see everything about it. And then she said, I wanted her to feel the pain that I felt. How else would I ever communicate this to her and how would she ever know who I am if she did not go through what I went through? I'm telling you, I felt such sorrow for her. What started out for me as thinking, you monster, 
And suddenly I thought, you poor, poor, sweet thing, dear God. Now, from that time on, the imprint of her is, I see her every morning. Every morning I see this woman. Every morning, she's like a saint for me. She's like a saint. Because what I realize from her, the gift she gave me, the gift, she went <coughs> and opened up how unbelievably irrational we are and we think we're not. That somehow we want other, other people who hurt us to know that part of us and we must get through to them. We will, we, we will try our best to get through to them. It becomes a language, a code. It becomes an essential way for us to try and pull up this anchor. We want them to know you formed us. You formed us. That there's a way you wounded me. That I don't want to be wounded. But I, I, need, I need you to acknowledge you wounded me. Now, part of us has to acknowledge we wounded others, and we have to go there too. Part of the healing also means we have to acknowledge how deeply we have wounded others in the same way they have wounded us. I'm sorry? No, no, I'm speaking to everybody through you. I'm just not talking to you. Yeah. 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 No, I'm speaking to everybody through you. I'm just speaking to everybody now, not just you. But, but you know, I, I think that, it, that eventually what we recognize is I'm looking for witness. I'm looking for somehow or other for things to be made right. I'm looking for the childhood I think I should have had. I'm, you know, you have to go deeper. It's not rational. You think, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. I, what would that look like? What, would, what, what is it that I'm looking for? What is it that I think is not right? Make something up. You have to make something up. It's not something you know. It's something absurd. It's something you feel. Maybe I, I think it should have been perfect. You have to get past being embarrassed to talk about it. What's missing in your life now that you think would have been there? What, are you fully happy now? No. Bingo. Then what would you put in your life now and, and you have to look at something's not right now, and it's their fault. Start there. You're blaming them for something, trust me. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, you know, you have your finger, your hand over your mouth, and you must think I can hear around the corner. <laughs> what about breaking patterns? Breaking patterns. If you were raised in a dysfunctional family. And I'm not going to, and you, you say, I'm not going to do this with my children. My family's going to be different. And you do it. And you do it anyway. No, no, no. Break the pattern. And you break the pattern. And your family is not like the childhood. And your family then is nothing like the family you turn out, that you grew up in. What's your question here? Oh, totally possible. Absolutely. 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 Totally. So is there a question in there? No, no, we don't. That's just it. We don't. When we, when we are conscious enough to say, you know, uh, I'm not going to be an alcoholic. It's not going to happen. 
It's not going to happen. I'm not going to drink. I'm not, I'm not, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to do these things. You know, that's how you, you, you break patterns. You decide, I saw this kind of abuse and I will never do that. Absolutely. Totally. Yes. 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 Wait, I, I got to take some other questions. The, the front only has so many privileges. <laughs> okay, go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are in the first, which is gravity, giving gravitas. You know, what, where you are giving gravity to things, weight, and why we give weight to things. You know, and, and, I, and, and what you give weight to, and why you give it to, the narratives you give weight to, the stories you tell yourself, why you tell yourself that. Why you do that? You know, the things, and they throw you off balance. And the anchors you have that throw you off balance, the stories you tell yourself, and they're not, and how you build your life around those stories. And, it, and they're so strong that when you have these stories, um, you will, you're, you'll go your whole life telling yourself something that's not true. And, and, you know, and you align that with healing. And the reason you can't heal is you won't give up the story. The, and, and the power of the story is so strong. So did all of you put down some of your stories, some of the things you were talking about? Okay, David's telling me it's time for a break. You need to take 20 minutes. 